RugbyRenegade.com, the number one online strength and conditioning program for rugby. Are you ready to get bigger, stronger, fitter, and faster and dominate your opposition? Welcome to the Rugby Renegade Podcast, where we build machines. Hello and welcome to the Rugby Renegade podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Pro Athlete Supplementation. Check them out at pas-nutrition.co.uk for all your supplementation needs. And don't forget that subscribers to the Rugby Renegade program get a 40% discount on retail prices. Welcome back to episode 45 of the Rugby Renegade podcast. My name is Jamie Bain and today I interview Mike McGurn, a strength and conditioning coach with a wealth of experience. Uh, As you'll hear, he's worked with uh, tons of successful teams and, and different sports. Um, so I'm sure you'll benefit from listening to this podcast. Uh, it's a quick one because he's a very busy man. He didn't have a lot of time, but he managed to squeeze it in. Uh, so give it a listen and let us know what you think. Hi, Mick. Welcome to the Rugby Renegade podcast. Great to have you on. Uh, we usually start by um, you just giving a bit of background about yourself, how you got into strength and conditioning and uh, some of the teams, uh, clubs and sports you've worked with. Okay. Uh, I've been a professional strength and conditioning coach now for got almost 20 years. Uh Started out in a a small place called Workington in Cumbria in the northeast of England. Uh, From my involvement with the rugby league club there, a guy called David Lloyd uh, headhunted me and brought me down to Hull and asked me to look after the condition of not only the Hull rugby league team, but also Hull City uh, soccer team. So I ended up double jobbing, which is quite a good experience because on the rugby side at the time, I learned a lot of what to do. And on the soccer side, I learned a lot of what not to do. So that was always a, a massive plus. Uh, on the back of that, then I moved on to Leeds, where I worked with the Leeds Rhinos and Leeds Unitas. And then probably after my two years at Leeds Rhinos, I got probably one of the best jobs in my life was working with uh, St. Helens Rugby League team. Because at the time, they had such good players. It didn't matter who the strength and distance coach was. They were going to be successful. Uh, and on the back of that, then I went over and worked with uh, the Irish National Rugby Union team for uh, seven seasons. I did about eight Six Nations, two World Cups, uh, and that was quite interesting, making the move from the professionalism of rugby league at the time to the the sort of uh, infancy of rugby union getting into professionalism. So it was a big chasm in the ability and strength and conditioning, so it was a, a big challenge. And then after that, then I moved on to the Ospreys uh, over in Wales, where I met your good self. And then uh, after I, I finished with the Ospreys, I started getting involved with Gaelic football back home and also working at Queen's University in Belfast and through where I've set up like an elite uh, athlete program for all our international athletes in rowing, athletics, swimming, golf. So it's quite diverse. Um, I'm also doing a lot of work now with Under Armour and Biosynergy in London and also KG Elite. So a lot going on, but very, very interesting and still very enjoyable. Yeah, oh, that's cool. Like the, the experience in all different sports, there's always stuff you can you can pick up from other sports, how they do things. Um, and, and you mentioned a couple of things there in terms of the football, kind of what not to do and, and where you learned what not to do and what to do. Could you elaborate on that a little bit, kind of what you what you found from football? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't mean to disparage football because there's a lot of people doing a lot of good work. But even back when I started in football, the, the role of the fitness coach or the S&C coach was viewed with a lot of uh, intrepidation and uh, scepticism. Because the, the, the sort of the mentality in football where if you weren't an ex-player, then you did that, you had no credibility. But I was working with the rugby league players and the football players at the same time. And the difference in professionalism in the rugby guys, we were so far ahead when it comes to nutrition, recovery, conditioning, uh, warm-ups, cool-downs, uh, rest days. And I, I dipped my toe back in the water in football in many aspects. Uh, I present on the UEFA A and B license over here in Northern Ireland. And I've done some consultancy work with some premiership clubs. And if I'm honest about it, it hasn't really caught up with the time still in many ways. There's still this attitude, well, I'm not going to do strength and conditioning. I'll pay the five grand fine. And that's the way it works, which I find bizarre. Having said that, uh, I have done a lot of work with Mick Clegg from Manchester United, who was uh, Alex Ferguson's fitness coach. And Mick's brilliant. He's, he's different. He, he got the respect of the players when he's at United. And he had the players cleaning, snatching, training hard, boxing, that sort of thing. So he was like a real beacon in the football world. But like I say, football's still got a bit, bit of work to do to catch up with the likes of rugby and other sports. 
Yeah, and and I was fortunate enough to visit Man United. I saw their setup, and yeah, you, you can see they do Olympic lifts and things like that. And and hopefully, I think uh, football's quite insular, and, and there's not many people come from other sports into football. You have to kind of, you know, in in your sort of stripes coming through football from the start. But the the England football team kind of had a few um, S and Cs from other sports, uh, hockey and and rugby as well. So hopefully, they're starting to see that you know they can get benefits from learning from other sports and. And that'll improve yeah. a bit. I know Dave Redding's there. He's a good friend of mine when he's involved with England. And Alan yeah. Beer, that used to be a monster, um, an Australian guy, he's involved too. And one of the big things they spoke about during the World Cup was the team dynamic and, and the honesty and transparency. And I'm sure the likes of Dave and, and Adam had a big part in playing with that, you know, because it seemed like England got back their mojo because they were enjoying the training, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and then <clears throat> you, you talked about um, being involved in, in league and then kind of moving into union at a time when kind of professionalism was still very early days. Um, how, how did you see that change in you and, and what did you try and bring from, from your league background? Well, the big thing I started at the same time as Mike Ford with their setup and he obviously came from rugby league too and been a big league in his time. There was no intensity at the time uh, in the gym. The training they were doing in the gym was bodybuilding training. It wasn't rugby related. And again, I'm not being critical of anybody. It's just the way it was. There was no uh, thought given to uh, recovery or nutrition. It was just, you know, once you finish training, eat what you want. You know, there was no real sort of cognizance to body fats and, you know, lean muscle mass. And there was no real development of speed and power. It was more aerobic training at the time. So. We had to change the mindset of the players and some of the provinces, which was a bit of a challenge. But you know, having forty on my side was a big help, and we probably cracked a few eggs along the way. But uh, you know, and then things did update, and now Ireland has one of the probably one of the most advanced SNC programs uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and you touched on a little bit there, but talking about boxing, and I know you worked with. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Was it Bernard Dunn? Bernard Dunn. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that and and how you've how you view boxing sort of in rugby and things like that yeah interesting dynamic uh i ha- i i hooked up with bernard with my la- when i was involved with my last year with ireland in 2008 and he'd just been knocked out knocked out in the first round of a, of a european qualifier or european title bout. so i said look at bernard i said you know all i know about boxing is it's very archaic and in, in, in its methods so i said let's rip up let, let's rip up the training manual let's do a social experiment you're my guinea pig uh let's train all anaerobic all your stuff in the gym will be power based. Let's look at your your involvement in the ring, what you do in the ring, how much grappling you do, because it's quite a lot in, in your in your division. So we ch- we change the whole training. No more long runs. No more losing a lot of weight before the fight. No more black plastic bags over the body and that sort of thing. It was all repeated speed, high high anaerobic training. We got him doing clean pulls, uh, jump squats. We got his uh, his body weight down to a, an optimum level six weeks before the fight and lo and behold he went on to be world champion not because of the training because he was very talented we just need to tweak a few things in his conditioning and uh he won it in a quite dramatic fashion he got knocked down twice in the fifth and had got knocked down a third time but luckily the bell went so he beat he beat the bell and he got then he knocked him on on the 11 so the condition helped but uh it was a good experiment for me uh but then as as in sport and in, in his, his next defensive title fight he got beat so all the training got slagged off as you do. So when you win, you're fit enough. When you lose, you're not fit enough. You know, and that's always the way. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, and, and so a question often comes up with some of our our followers and subscribers and things is how to do. Obviously, rugby players train quite intensely anyway. But how to get in, fit in, kind of extras or top ups. How how do you approach that with your athletes? Well. I take a very much an individual approach, like every athlete's individual. So their the gym programs individual, they're conditioned to, to a point individual. So if players need extras, I would do do it at the end of training. So say I had a, a centre or winger who needed a bit more sort of like anaerobic uh, endurance. When the session was over, we might take them out out from the group and do ten minutes of top ups at the end of training. Or if it might be a case where they might need a bit more power development in the gym. We might take them in before training away from the group and do an extra 15 20 minutes and i found over the course of a season doing those little top-ups okay it won't don't it won't give you the utmost development but it stops you from detraining because obviously when you're in a training cycle where there's a lot of uh, competition 
and you're you're tapering and deloading, tapering and deloading, you find the players will detrain quite a lot. And I noticed that in during the Six Nations when we get got together uh, as a team, a lot of our international players would get PBs when they're in uh, Six Nations camps, which shouldn't be the case because of the, the nature of the matches, the intensity. But it was the environment that the players were creating that they were so competitive. They wanted to go in and do these extra top ups and get their PBs. So that that's how I approach that. Yeah. No, that that's really interesting to say they're they're peaking then. Um but it just it just shows you can still get get some good numbers, you know, during com- competitive periods, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh now this is a question we, we ask all the, the guests on the podcast and it's what do you think is the biggest mistake rugby players make when it comes to strength and conditioning? Well I've got to put my hand up here, Jamie, and said I made this mistake with my players. I I didn't do enough mobility with them and movement movement training to, to get them to move better at the start. So I think that's also something they could keep working on because rugby players are still getting injured. Uh, so I think just keeping your movement pure and being able to, to recover better so you can train better the next time, the next, the next session. So I made that mistake where I didn't do enough pre-mobility and post-mobility in the gym and on the pitch. Yeah, that's good advice, great advice. Uh, and then an, another regular question we have is uh, what advice would you give to upcoming strength coaches? I think I think strength coaches need to have their own philosophy, okay? None of us know it all. We never will do. Let's learn from each other. Let's be very open about what we do. Let's share because, you know, when I, was, when I started, I had the great... Uh, the thing of the, I met Dan Baker out in the Brisbane Broncos. I met Ashley Jones. I met David Boyle, who was so open with me about what they do, and that really helped me along the way. So I think as we go through our careers, we need to share with other strength and up and coming strength and distance coaches. But I think the strength and distance coaches can speak to us, listen to us, but shape their own philosophy and stick to what they believe in. Don't become like a, ro- a robot of somebody else or, or a clone. Be your own person. And if you believe in something, stick to it, you know, but learn from other coaches as well. Yeah, I often, often think it's, um, you know, it, it doesn't look well on a, a young coach when they go on a, like a CPD event or a course or something, they come back and they completely, you know, re, you know, completely change their sort of philosophy based on that. It's kind of learn to sort of pick things you like and, and add that to your own thing. But, you know, like you say, have, have your own philosophy. Um, Absolutely. Definitely good advice. Yeah. Now, um, talked to the last kind of few podcasts we talked a lot about kind of sports science and how it's used uh what what are your thoughts on it um i mean there's a lot of stuff sort of saying that in some cases we kind of use sports science to kind of actually soften the the athletes um what do you what do you think and what do you think is the the future or the best way to use it moving forward yeah i mean i would agree a lot of that that statement that it can soften athletes to, to a certain extent I do realise the importance of sports science and that we need to train smarter and we can use sports science to give us better data to get players in better shape. I suppose I, I started, I'm an old school strength and distance coach where there was no sports science at the start, so I've seen the evolution of, the, uh, evolution of it and, and how it's come through. I think we need a certain amount, okay, but I think we are overdoing it a wee bit with the sports science. I think when it comes to GPS and distance covered and metrics, we can use them to shape our training better. But I still think we need to remember, in order to get good athletes, we still need to train hard. Uh, I've seen this firsthand out in Australia. I do a lot of presenting for the ASCA, that's that's what I'm qualified with. And I have noticed over the last sort of eight, nine years, the dilution of the Australian athletes when it comes to strength and conditioning. And speaking to a lot of the coaches who work in the AFL, in the NRL, and even Australian Rugby Union, they are very frustrated in that they're not allowed to do the training they want to because of sports science. Mm. So there needs to be a balance of let's train hard, definitely train hard, let's recover well, let's use sports science to uh, formulate and shape our our next day's training. But certainly if we want to squat 180K and and squat hard, let's not have a sports science say that's too much, okay? We need to get a good balance and we need to keep the players still strong, even from a parental point of view and from that robustness that they need to play their sport. Yeah, definitely. That that certainly came up in one of the last podcasts. Is it? Yeah, we're trying to build robust athletes. If we don't push them hard, you're not actually going to get get that development. Um, I think what you're saying about the in terms of the GPS stuff, it's like the way we use sports science in the gym is to try and motivate and build competition and things like that. I think that's how we should 
look at the, the GPS stuff, use it to you know drive the amount of high intensity efforts and the high speed running we're doing and things like that, as opposed to sort of just using it as a you know they're they're doing too much type of type of metric. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I do, and I mean, what's more important to to get the set piece race and do ten more set pieces and get them right, or that Jimmy doesn't cover an extra five hundred meters? I mean, for me as an SNE coach, I'd be on the coach's side. Let's get the set piece done. Let's get it done right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. And let's let's talk more sort of gym based now. Um, you mentioned kind of Olympic lifting, and and you th- see it's good that some football teams are starting to use that. And what are your what are your thoughts on it? There's, I think you have some people who kind of sort of sit on the fence and go a bit of both, which is, that's definitely the rugby renegade philosophy. You know, use it when you can with athletes you can. Um, and then there's some people who say don't use Olympic weightlifting at all. What are your thoughts? No, well, look, what gives you the biggest bang for your buck? Well, the reinforced development from the Olympic, Olympic lifting. I realise it doesn't suit everybody, and not all my athletes do Olympic lifting. For number one, they can't do it, or number two, they have injuries, yeah. or number three, it, it can create some sort of uh, environment for them where they, they end up feeling sore or tired. So we don't do it, but if, an, if one of my athletes can Olympic lift and, then, and can Olympic lift safely, then I, I certainly do it. It might be a clean pull, it might be just a loaded barbell jump squat, something like that there, but I do find that like when it comes to getting big power output, that that's my big my big go-to lifts, you know. Yeah, and then um, in terms of still in the gym, in terms of kind of strength and and hypertrophy development, what what's your approach there? And like sometimes you have an issue with players focusing too much on hypertrophy. So what what would you say is your limit? Well, again, I mean, there are players that need it for rugby. I mean, there's no doubt about it. So, I mean, I, a lot of my, my programs I conjugate where I'll do my reactive work, I'll do my strength work, and I'll, I'll add on some hypertrophy at the end, you know. Uh, look, at it. we need athletes to be strong, especially in contact sports like rugby, football, Gaelic football, uh, hockey, that sort of stuff. So I, I'm all for it if it's beneficial, you know. My, my big sort of like crux with it, though, is if you're going to do work on hypertrophy, that you, you add in the mobility with it. So if you are going to get bigger, you're able to move with us, you know, yeah. and move correctly. Yeah, definitely. And then, and then, in terms of strength development, what are your, what are your go-to approaches for that? Any kind of protocols or sets and reps schemes you you like to use? Uh, look at again. I'm pretty old school. I, I like the start starting strength West Side Barbell five by five. I mean, you can't yeah. go too long for that, you know. Uh, also, I use uh, a few methods that I've got from Ashley Jones. The the, the rule of twenty four. That we're going to develop strength any sort of methodology that'll give us a total number of reps of 24, so 8 by 3, uh, 12 by 2, 6 by 4, that sort of stuff as well. It's quite quite, quite beneficial. And I actually use that for years with the All Blacks, so if it's good enough for the All Blacks, then it's good enough for me, you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. No, we're big fans of Ashley. He's, he's been on the podcast, and yeah, he's got some real sort of practical, simple Brilliant. ways to, you know, get good results. Yeah, very good. Very simple, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so lastly, I, I know you're a busy man. I know you're a busy man, and uh, you need to crack on. But uh, where can people learn more about yourself and what you're doing? Uh, oh, I suppose Google. Uh, I, I I don't do Twitter or Facebook. I just three young kids don't have time. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I put stuff up on LinkedIn. I do some stuff for uh, strength performance, a few things now and again. Uh, I should probably do a lot more, and that's one of my goals for, for the next the next couple of years to start putting more stuff up there just to share with people. Not that I want uh, publicity. It's just that I'm getting the stage in my life where I'm getting old, and I need to put something back in the industry. Like I say, uh, I think we, we have a great industry. We have some great people involved, not only in the UK, but in Europe and all over in the Southern Hemisphere. And I think the best people in our industry do share information because we realise we have a duty of care to grow the industry as much as we can, but grow it correctly. So I'll just put stuff up on LinkedIn. I'll put stuff up on my website. And uh, if people want to get in touch, no problem. It's also another big thing, Jimmy, with my internships. If people want to come do an internship with me, they're fine. That's not a problem. But if they come, they take the warm-up. I walk out of the gym and they take part of the session. They don't stand in the corner and, and brush the gym. That's what it's about. It's trying to get people involved and, and, and to grow them, you know. So. Yeah, that's that's great. That's it. And having having spent a short period uh, as an intern under you, I know, you know, it's encouraging people to get stuck in and and you you learn through coaching essentially, don't you? And you absolutely. create a really good environment to do that. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. And of course, we'll share all those uh, links to to your LinkedIn and uh, and your website in the show notes. Um, and and what's what's the future hold for you? Uh, like I say, I'm getting old now and three young kids, so uh, you know I'll be stuck here in Belfast. Uh, I think for the next foreseeable, 
I'm doing a lot of work in Europe with KG Elite, representing on an s &C, uh, course, which is going quite well. And uh, I duck over to Australia now and again and present at their conferences. So more educational work now, which is quite good. I, I like that, you know, and, and also I'm getting my hands dirty and with the, the elite athletes at Queen's. So I'm getting a bit, of, a, a bit of both, you know. Yeah, that sounds like a really nice balance. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, Mick, you've been a star. Thank you very much for coming on and you know sharing your experience with us um, and all the best for the future. Thank you very much and good, and good luck to all the people that listen to the podcast with their careers. Cheers, Mick. Okay. Great stuff. Thanks, Mick, uh, for finding the time to talk to us and share your experience on the podcast. Uh, please stay tuned for more podcasts. Please subscribe to us on SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn or iTunes and give us a five-star review. Uh, and any questions you have for our guests on the podcast, please get them to us uh, via social media. And of course, check out the world's number one online subscription program for rugby at rugbyrenegade.com. Until next time. Thanks for listening to the Rugby Renegade Podcast. For more quality rugby strength and conditioning information, check us out at rugbyrenegade.com. Rugby Renegade, building machines.